good to go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are in the world, and welcome to this uh, important session at uh, the World Health Summit. Um, so much of the discussion here has, of course, been on COVID-19. So, uh, in fact, we're going to talk about something completely different, which is really important because we must not lose sight of the rest of health just because COVID is taking so much of our attention at the moment. So this session uh, is about uh, access to essential medicines for non-communicable diseases. And we have a very distinguished panel. Uh, but first of all, we're going to start with um, a um, discussion uh, about the essential medicines list, uh, what it is and why it's extremely important. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Benedict, but just before I do, I just want to explain how the, the session is, is going to work. So Benedict is going to talk about the essential medicines list. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have a session on cancer and a session on diabetes. And we're very pleased that, that uh, drugs in, in both these areas have been included in the new essential medicines list that was uh, released uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And we're also very pleased that for the first time, um, the WHO has suggested that the medicines patent pool should intervene to try and bring down prices and make them affordable uh, for some of the upcoming treatments. And so we will be working extremely hard with originator companies to try and do that. Uh, so with that, I will turn over to Bentik Huttner from the uh, Essential Medicines uh, Department in WHO to give you an overview. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for the organizers to um, give me the opportunity to talk about the Essential Medicines list. So I have some introductory slides explaining what it actually is. Um, the first list was established in 1977. At that time, um, there were 240 medicines included. Um, and um, over time, the process for and the criteria for including have been refined. And every two years, an expert committee is convened that suggests additions. And um, the last expert committee just happened in June of this year. And uh, you see a lot of application, 88 applications. And um, while um, some uh, were uh, not added. Um, a lot of them were actually added, like um, insulin analogs that were mentioned, many cancer medicines, um, et cetera. So now we nearly have twice as many medicines as in 1977, 479. And since 2007, um, there is also an essential medicines list for children, which has slightly fewer medicines. So a large increase in the number of medicines. Um, what is the concept? How are they defined? So um, it, it's, the definition remains a bit fuzzy. Um, it's, it's called that, that essential medicines are so that satisfy the priority healthcare needs of the population. And they're elected with regard to disease prevalence, but that's not uh, necessarily the main criterion. Public health relevance, evidence of efficacy and safety, and comparative cost effectiveness. And what about the price or cost of the medicines? Uh, in 2001, when the criteria were last re uh, redefined, uh, it was explicitly mentioned that the absolute cost of a medicine should not be a reason to exclude it from the model list um, if it otherwise meets the criteria for efficacy and safety and public health relevance. And cost-effective uh, co comparisons theoretically are limited to medicines within the therapeutic same therapeutic group. However, that is than defined. Um, and importantly, essential medicines should be available um, in health system at all times, adequate amounts, appropriate dosage forms, the assured quality, adequate information, and importantly, also at a price that the individual and the community can afford. And as already uh, was alluded for before, that is um, certainly not uh, always the case. Um, it's a forward-looking uh, global concept. Um, it's not a list uh, for, for 
low middle income countries, uh, at least that's not their ambition. Um, it's regularly updated and always tries to incorporate new therapeutic options, adapting to changing therapeutic needs. Um, quality of medicines is an important point and um, obviously um, there's also a need to adapt it to emerging diseases, changing resistance patterns and pathogens, etc. I just, I know the session is about non-communicable diseases, but I think the example of hepatitis C is a good, to see, um, a good example to see how um, high prices were tackled and access was assured. Um, so in 2015, um, direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C were added to the essential medicines list. Uh, six uh, oral um, um, TAAs, which you can see here. And um, this, this was done despite the very high price, at least uh, for the originals at, at that time, was often over 80,000 US dollars per treatment cost. And the expert committee recommended WHO to take actions at global level to make these medicines accessible and affordable. And uh, now in 2021, there were just uh, a few new additions, contains multiple pangenotitic uh, uh, treatment options that can be considered therapeutically equivalent to facilitate selection at the country level. And um, if we look at what happens in terms of cost and access, um, it's uh, clear that uh, the cost um, of the generics now is uh, very low, as low as 60 US dollars for a treatment cost. Um, and the MPP has three hepatitis C direct acting uh, antivirals on its list. And um, the access is also expanding. It's true that the access is still not where it should be. It's estimated that about five of 71 million people, so about 70% with chronic hepatitis C are treated. But it's not only the problem of access to antivirals, it's also the problem that a lot of people with chronic hepatitis C do not know they are infected. So diagnosis plays an important role here too. Now let me switch to non-communicable diseases and anti-cancer medicines. As you know, the majority of cancers and cancer deaths occur in low middle income countries. They tend to be more advanced when they're diagnosed and there is a lack of access to diagnosis and treatments. And um, this is just a timeline of the evolution of anti-cancer medicines on the uh, model list, you see that in the beginning there were six medicines added and then over time there were some reviews, but it's really uh, over the last uh, um, um, four or five years um, that um, there's been a lot of movement and there was a EML cancer medicines working group established. Uh, and uh, you see that also some um, biosimilars have now been pre-qualified by WHO, trastuzumab in 2019, rituximab in 2020, and now we are at 62 medicines, um, anti-cancer medicines on CML, so a tenfold increase since 1977. The, I mentioned the cancer medicines working group. The idea was to um, have a more comprehensive evaluation of available treatment options uh, for different cancers, including also importantly recently approved medicines, and also to help WHO establish guiding principle and clarify what is an essential medicine in uh, oncology. And after many years of discussion, what was finally established as an, a threshold was uh, a four to six month improvement in median overall survival. So if a medicine does not meet these criteria, generally it should not be considered an essential medicine. Now, um, uh, we know that anti-cancer medicines, even the old ones are not widely available. They are unaffordable for many patients and healthcare systems. This was a survey done among um, about a thousand oncologists from 82 countries. And the question was, which 10 cancer medicines would you take uh, if you had to go to a desert um, island? And um, if you look at the top 20, 19 of the 20 were already listed on the EML. But uh, very importantly, um, from the respondents in um, low and middle income country, between 13% to 68% reported uh, the risk of catastrophic expenditure for their patients 
uh, even for the older generic cytotoxic medicines. And we know that in many high income countries, that's also an issue. I think there's some estimates that the new cancer medicines approved in the US about 150,000 US dollars per year. And um, if you compare it to those, uh, different countries, definitely the prices are um, completely unaffordable for most patients. And I want to specifically now talk about the checkpoint inhibitors. You may have heard that there has been uh, somewhat a revolution in oncology with um, uh, immunotherapy at different types of immunotherapy, but essentially the checkpoint inhibitors um, allow the immune system to better attack um, cancer cells, so different types. But um, in melanoma, so uh, skin cancer, very aggressive skin cancer, um, it really showed marked improvement of survival. So on the one side of the screen, you see the survival cost with classic chemotherapy, where um, relatively quickly after one year, you have uh, uh, most patients um, actually um, having died. And with immune therapy, a marked increase in survival. And um, this led to uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors being added to the essential medicines list in 2019 for the uh, indication um, metastatic melanoma, but it's clear that this is a relatively rare cancer still, and especially it's a cancer that mostly affects uh, people in high-income countries. If you look at the incidence, it's Australia, Europe, North America, and low, not low middle-income countries. And um, why do I mention it? Because in 2021, we had applications for to add checkpoint inhibitors for non-small cell lung cancer. And as you know, uh, non uh, lung cancer is the most um, one of the cancer with the highest mortality overall worldwide. Very prevalent in many low middle income countries. And um, checkpoint inhibitors have definitely um, a, a, an impact on survival, at least for a subset of uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But the committee ran into the problem that, um, that despite the criteria for effectiveness being um, fulfilled, they um, did not recommend it uh, currently because of the prohibitively expensive um, prices in, in in the current um, in, um, currently. And um, it's not only the prices, there was also some concern about the feasibility of appropriate use in many settings. These, uh, many, these um, immune checkpoint inhibitors and many other anti-cancer therapies need uh, quite sophisticated diagnostics and the infrastructure uh, uh, is often not available. But um, this is definitely something that is uh, going to uh, be rediscussed in future expert committees because checkpoint inhibitors have um, expanding indications. Um, hardly a month goes by when there is not an article in one of the big medical journals um, uh, uh, reporting a randomized trial for immune checkpoint inhibitors for cancer. There was an interesting study published in Chama Network Open that just looked at how many cases of cancer in the United States would be theoretically eligible for immune checkpoint inhibitors. And it's about one in three. And um, so a constantly growing patient population and not necessarily all cancers respond the same way uh, to immune therapy. So um, essentially a larger pool of patients was potentially also then uh, a del uh, delusion a little bit of the, of the benefit. So it's something that's uh, definitely going to keep us busy. Um, and um, it's not just the very expensive medicines that are unaffordable. Even all generic low price medicines are unaffordable. And the classic example is here, the insulins with an estimated 6% of the world population concerned. And uh, you, you know, it's been repeated so often that this is a centenary of insulin's discovery. And despite that fact, it remains unaffordable at prices that vary a little bit, but even $10 per month are not affordable for, for many patients for a lifelong treatment. And this just doesn't include um, uh, tests for diagnostics, measuring blood glucose, et cetera. And in 2021, long-acting insulin analogs were added, fully acknowledging that the clinical benefit over human insulin may be limited, maybe in certain patient populations. Um, but um, the idea was to facilitate pre-qualification, increase competition, and improve access, because pre-qualification for human insulin, there has not really been an expression of interest, despite efforts by WHO to make human insulin more um, accessible. 
Um, now, just some words about national essential medicines list. So the model lists are explicitly model lists. So the idea is that then countries should take this model list to decide which medicines are the priorities for their population. So it's a, a blueprint for the national lists. And it's, uh, we have a very long technical report and it provides, contains all the evidence. And it's a starting point also for, for prioritizing reimbursement in certain countries. Um, but if you look at um, the differences between model lists and national lists, they are quite important. Um, so some of it is expected, but what you see here is in blue, that's a core list in, in, in orange, that's complementary. That's just medicines that need a little more specialized care. So you would expect that maybe the concordance is a little less, but um, in most countries, um, um, by far not all medicines on the EML are uh, on the national EMLs. And um, it's not so infrequent that even withdrawn medicines are still on the essential medicines list. This was an analysis from the PAO regions and every list still contained at least one medicine that was um, withdrawn due to adverse effect by a national regulatory board. And if you look specifically at cancer medicine, so it's maybe a little difficult to understand, but it's a, essentially a rock curve. So on the top left corner, you have the WHO essential medicine system. All medicines that are on the model list are included and no other medicines are included. So the further you go to the right, the more you have um, also other medicines that are not on the WHO essential medicines list included. And the lower you go, the fewer of medicines on the medicines uh, on the WHO model list are on the national list and you see that there's a net correlation so the more uh, medicines are that are on the model list are included in the national list the fewer then there are also um, um, not essential medicines based on uh, WHO criteria who are included and the more cancer medicines are listed general the more it's then concordant with um, WHO uh, model list and uh, country implementation for nationalists is, is, is an issue. There was a, a, a guide that was published uh, by WHO a few years ago. There's also now a database where you can look. It's clear that um, updating nationalists every two years is uh, difficult in many settings. The process um, um, is not always uh, clearly defined. So there's probably also um, a role for WHO to support countries better in uh, selecting and, and updating the, the national essential medicines list. So in, in conclusions, essential medicines are a global concept and it's not a basic list for poor countries. The prohibitively priced but potentially essential medicines pose an increasing challenge and there are urgently actions needed uh, to um, uh, such as public health oriented licensing through the medicine patents pool and uh, 2021 expert committee recommended the establishment of an EML price working group that looks specifically also at checkpoint inhibitors, but also at insulins to establish how these medicines can be made affordable, what should be done at what price that can be affordable, et cetera. And um, it can't just be the medicines, we need also the diagnostics, we need uh, the infrastructure, there need to be the specialists, so the health systems need to be strengthened, and we need to integrate maybe the medicines list even more strongly with the model lists of essential in vitro diagnostics and priority medical devices, because if you can't diagnose the type of mutation or the expression of um, a certain receptors, you cannot use, for example, cancer medicines appropriately. And inclusion of medicines in the email is an important step to achieve universal health coverage and also protect against financial risk, assure the quality, and hopefully make uh, affordable uh, essential medicines uh, available for everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Benedict. Uh, I hope the mic was on. Yes, so I remain seated. Thanks a lot for that introductory um, outline and i'm supposed for the next 30 minutes to sort of moderate through a zoom in on cancer treatments and i think benedict already alluded to a few key challenges so what we will do we shed light on a few key challenges and also potential entry points uh, to improve access to uh, cancer treatment we've got linda grief with us online from south africa if i understand correctly and thomas kearney who's the ceo of the ifpma 
And we would start uh, with Linda, who will give us a bit of a perspective from the patient's side on you know, what, it, what it means basically in South Africa to receive or not to receive a cancer diagnosis and appropriate care. Over to you, Linda. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Yes, in South Africa, we have many uh, barriers to access to medicine. And one of those are the things that, um, you know, that, that hamper affordability, accessibility, and the access to patients. So when we did our first report in 2070 on patent barriers of cancer, uh, uh, the impact of cancer medicine, we found that out of 24 medicines, only seven, seven medicines were available in the public sector. Um, Sorry, I'm at the wrong slide. Sorry about that. Let me just start again. The South African Cancer Service are in crisis currently at the, as we stand. We mainly due to the lack of functional uh, regulatory structure. And this makes it really difficult to do proper planning and management of cancer services, as well as the crippling effect of the state capture and the compromised impact that that has on health care in general and the derelict state that our health care system is in. The recent health economic modeling report that we published in August 21 by the Cancer Alliance, the burden of cancer incidence in our country is expected to double to 160,000 by 2030. Unfortunately, South Africa has a two-tiered health structure. Most, um, you know, importantly, this is a big um, reason for the inequitability of the cancer services in our, in our country. Firstly, we have the public sector a service that services 84% of the population, but only has 16% of the healthcare professionals available to serve that population. The medicines available there are usually gold standard generics and new medicines like Keytruda at a price of 6,559 US dollars are not available in the public sector and could, could actually be used very effectively in low and middle income countries. Um, and it's definitely not available for lung cancer and advanced, advanced breast cancers and hematological cancers. Um, and then the second tier is the, the private health sector, which performs 16% of, serves 16% of the population. 84% of our healthcare professionals actually work in that sector. So you can see the great inequality that there is. In our recent report that we published on patent barriers, we looked at 24 medicines. Only seven of these medicines were available in the public sector, whilst 10 were, avail were, were on the essential medicines list of the World Health Organization. So patents block generic availability, and this lends to, leads to inequitable access to care. And the private sector patients are often also restricted because a lot of the medical aids do not include these medicines on their formularies either. The second point is that we, the second report that we published this year was highlighting the details of issues that impact our uh, access availability and affordability. And in our constitution in section 27, it clearly speaks about that your address should not determine your, your uh, access to medicine. However, our tender pricing process in the public sector and the single exit pricing model in the private sector is at a core of the lack of access due to poor administration, high pricing of cancer drugs. So we remain very, very concerned and we need the collaboration of worldwide stakeholders like the World Health Organization and MPP to take hands and work towards a more ethical practice in pricing guidelines that can be adjusted to make drugs more available within low and middle income countries. Um, in our second report, the key recommendations that we had was to uh, devise a meaningful system for cancer surveillance and registration in South Africa. Our current system is still a hand system and really not, uh, not working properly. We need to look at promulgation of regulations, rebonusing practices. Uh, this was published in 2017, but since then nothing has happened. So really a serious problem. The second thing is that the medicines that, um, that we have currently within our, um, in our tender system, medicines are, are kind of procured in a way that photocopying machines are procured. And we really need to find a new way of procurement, um, um, a really essential medicines, and our Medicine Act needs to be adjusted to accommodate this. Increased funding needed to, uh, for management and also 
certainly because of the doubling of the cancer prevalence that we are expecting by 2030. And resources need to be um, you know, opened up so that we can mitigate this challenge. The constructive solutions regarding the availability of drugs in low and middle income countries remain a big problem. The oncology market remains small. Options such as pool procurement and cross-border collaboration should be investigated to improve access. And we look forward to work with um, the organizations involved in this regard. We need a rational, fair and transparent pricing system and steps need to be taken that will ensure that the regulatory environment is changed to expand uh, access of the human rights of patients and make access to medicine more equitably available. In our own country, we are still struggling with our DTI uh, department who, who governs patents because even though the patent law has been changed, nothing has been done to take that any step further. And we are still waiting for the competition law to investigate irregular uh, competition aspects. And the investigation with regards to Roche and Trisutumab in our country has still not been concluded. The National Planning Commission has indicated that an inquiry should be done into the pharmaceutical industry, just like we did uh, previously with the healthcare, private healthcare industry, but nothing has also been done to really forward this action. So advocacy is very much needed. So the Afri South African Health Products Authority, SAPRA, is in a real array and is a core issue that is affecting affordability and accessibility of cancer drugs in South Africa. Section 21 medicines remain very hard uh, to access once they've been registered as they become, become in a, absolutely unaffordable. So in closing, the collaboration with the Nantes Works that was recently uh, announced uh, between uh, Nantes Works and the South African research community to transfer biological manufacturing technology for COVID and cancer vaccines we welcome that announcement and it really gives us hope. South Africa Africa requires investment in local production and manufacturing is needed of medicines to deal with the growing health burden in our countries in Africa and other low and middle income countries. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Linda, for that uh, deep dive and that very clear and concrete illustration of the key challenges in South Africa in terms of cancer treatment, also some of the concrete proposals you, you've been making. I turn over to Thomas Kearney for the next five to seven minutes. And, and Thomas, we know that the pharma industry has been quite active on NCDs. Uh, actually, when we have a look, we see that very few bilateral donors are investing into NCDs. It's actually more the private sector, including philanthropy so far. Could you uh, outline a little bit uh, what the industry is doing in terms of access to uh, NCT treatments and, and probably more concretely, even more precisely on, on cancer. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, I will digress a little bit beyond just the NCD because we are still in the midst of a pandemic. But I want to start where uh, Benedict was explaining the essential medicines list. And when I look back uh, 10, 20 years ago, by and large, pharma companies, innovative pharma com companies would have been keen not to get on the essential medicines list because the essential medicines list was seen as just a political tool by WHO, uh, harassing the industry and not really of much interest. I've seen a big shift in terms of industry does believe that medicines which are game changers, which can be life-saving, should be on the essential medicines list. And I recently had a discussion uh, with uh, Benedict's boss in Geneva, actually challenging her on one element. When you look at the criteria for inclusion in the medicines list, essential medicines list, it should be medical. It should be medical need, public health need. And he talked about price, price, and price. Uh, I'm not quite sure that's the right approach because also I've seen more recently in discussions with Unitate and WHO on COVID-19 treatments, for example, that the initial assumption price is skyrocket high, therefore price is the issue. They never, they never tested the willingness of companies to get 
pretty boldly into tiered pricing system. And I think that's the second element which has changed. Therefore, companies are really interested. And those of you who were here at the opening ceremony on Sunday evening heard Bill Anderson and Stefan Ulrich both saying, we need to do more because innovation is meaningless if it doesn't reach the patients. And 10 years ago, you would have heard company CEOs, my you know, market access people tell me if you do tiered pricing, you shoot yourself in the foot. Now companies have found that it can work, it does work. And we see companies in cancer as well as in vaccines and COVID treatments doing this on a large scale. And, and therefore, I think the, you know, the parameters have changed and are changing. And again, before I get into the cancer, but also diabetes, uh, let me just mention COVID-19 vaccines. For example, we are all hoping that we really get out of the pandemic because of safe and effective vaccine. Now, some companies have announced not-for-profit, at-for-cost uh, pricing policy during the pandemic. You couldn't have an industry, general industry approach for antitrust compliance reasons. But for example, the most you know, used COVID-19 vaccine uh, so far is the one from BioNTech Pfizer. They have clearly stated that in rich countries, they basically charge the price of a takeaway meal, which is the price of a hamburger. I'm not sure that you could get one in Geneva for that price. Middle-income countries pay about half of that. And for low-income countries, for COVAX, they're sold at for cost. That's, by the way, what the United States paid when they bought large volumes. And hopefully we will see soon a big acceleration in the increase. I think that shows what's happening in the vaccines area. When you look at the treatment area, we have recently had the great news of molnupiravir. Molnupiravir, the first small molecule antiviral treatment, and Merck, Sharp and Dome, MSD outside the US, Merck and Co in the US, they have entered into voluntary license agreement on a pretty large scale before they even knew that the drug would work, before they even had to face two results. And now they already have eight voluntary license agreement with Indian generic companies. And hopefully, Charles, I keep my fingers crossed, maybe it already happened. They will sign up with the MPP because that company too is deeply conscious that if you want to make sure that these treatments reach people in poor countries, they need to be affordable. Now, in terms of affordability, and that goes for NCDs in cancer, and diabetes, for example, we have the, uh, you know, the centennial of insulin this year. I was a few years ago in Thailand. Now, Thailand is a middle income countries and the cost of insulin was all over the debate in the panel I attended. When I looked it up in peer review journal, 12% of the cost of diabetes in Thailand was actually the cost of the drug. 88% was non-drug related cost. And that's pretty much the same in many disease areas. Now, again, what I see is companies are really moving to some extent with the MPP, to some extent with volunteer licensing. We see this in Hep C, for example, to a large extent also through tiered pricing approaches. They are willing to do that. And they're willing to do more because as I said, innovation is meaningless. If it doesn't reach the patient. Now, in my view, I think we also need to look into what are the systems conditions. We see in COVID-19 how even rich countries' healthcare systems were not resilient to the pandemic. And we see the same problem. I've last night over dinner said, for me, the big disappointment in the Act A accelerator is that basically the healthcare systems pillow which is there to make sure that the infrastructure there has evaporated. I don't know what happened. The World Bank basically was supposed to be in charge, but nobody talks about the healthcare systems accelerator uh, pillar yet still. And one of the problems when I look into what needs to be done is, I do believe we need, need to move away from a CSR, corporate social responsibility, philanthropy model, to a sustainable model. And sustainable model, and we also actually centennial of insulin. 
We also had the 20th anniversary of the Abuja Declaration. 2001, 54 African countries committed to spending at least 15% of their national budget on healthcare. 20 years after, I think it's less than five meeting that target. And therefore, we really need to have a willingness from the industry to make our medicines more affordable, to sit down with stakeholders, including, for example, in the diabetes uh, area, people living with diabetes, because they know what they need. The testing, the carers, and the treatment, all of that, companies are willing to do that. We see the MPP as a conduit among others, it's not the only one. And one of course of the challenges Charles Gore and his team are meeting, and a couple of years ago I discussed this in the context of MDR-TB, multidrug resistant TB. The conclusion at that time was, there's no sustainable market for that, Bedekalin it was. And that's why it, it really didn't work out at that time. And I think we need to look at the same, whether it's for cancer drugs, whether it's for cardiovascular, most of them are now off patent. And I think today we will see big launch of, you know, cardiovascular initiative, which is important because it's still the biggest killer. But we in the industry, we do see the MPP as a trusted partner. We do also see it as a way of working to make our treatments, our innovation more accessible. Back to you, Alex. Thanks a lot, Thomas. Also to both speakers for keeping time. Jelise, I don't know whether we have already first questions from, yes? Not yet, so otherwise I would start and I would also ask all of you, if you, is anybody in the audience who's got a question or a comment, please give us a sign. So I would probably start with Linda and, and then also Benedict. Uh, Linda, you, you alluded to a number of challenges around access to treatment. Uh, my question would be, where do you see in the specific case of South Africa the most promising entry points or which type of cancer uh, treatments, where would you place emphasis for a start? I mean, you have, obviously you have already some things in place. Um, and, and what are the best buys and, and where would you start to actually uh, tackle some of these challenges and with which specific, you know, cancer drug or, or, or part of the cancer care? Over to you. Sorry, I was on mute. I'm, so in South Africa, I think we have a big problem currently with Drusizumab because it's only available in a few provinces um, and not to the whole of South Africa for, for even wide use in early breast cancer. Uh, so certainly for us, we would like to see that use expanding to um, use for um, even for advanced breast cancer because we know what the benefits are for that. Um, that would certainly be one. Um, I think Retruda is, is another one that we um, we can use not only for melanoma, but also uh, indicated for other, uh, other cancers. But the problem remains that the costing is so high. And in our, in our current system, the treasury is, the, our, our whole procurement issue of medication is un, unsustainable. It's not working. We really have problems of equity, even between provinces. Um, uh, due to our two-tiered system. So we first need to fix our internal uh, issues uh, to get a more workable model. And a lot of our advocacy currently is focused on uh, hosting solution labs with pharma companies, with um, universities, and to really look at, you know, what will give that sustainable change like that the previous speaker just talked about. We can't be using philanthropy and, and NGOs to try and, and, and navigate the space, it's too complex. And that's why the partnership with MPP is so, it's such an important one for us. And we place a lot of hope in that for Africa. Um, so we look forward to that collaboration. And in the meantime, we're going to try and, you know, get our, our uh, internal house in order through advocacy. And we are, we are really at a, pro, at a step now where we're looking at serious social action, not just you know, polite talking around conference tables anymore because it doesn't seem to be working. So we are really looking from an in-house perspective to um, co uh, collaborate with community organizations 
uh, like Section 27 um, and a lot of the AIDS organizations, because a lot of the AIDS organizations are also now struggling with hematological cancers due to AIDS. And the lymphomas and those patients are also struggling with access to medicine. So those are the, the issues that we find um, core at the moment, I would say. Thanks a lot, Linda. I think we've got a question from... We've got two questions. I forgot the question. I forgot the microphone. So the first question: uh, How will um, how sustainable will the model being proposed by pharma be? And so this question is for Thomas. And there is another question for Thomas: Do you think companies address access early enough? Because from what we see at the moment, still see today, there is such a lag between when medicines become available in low and middle income countries? I think the, there are two questions and I will be short and succinct to both. Uh, the first answer is sustainability is really absolutely key. And right now, when we look at the approach, for example, in COVID-19, we do know, and that will not change in the short term, that overseas development assess assistance will be key to end the pandemic in the AMC 91, or if you include the India 92 countries. Therefore, we are far from having a sustainable approach yet. And that's why the UHC and healthcare assistance pill is so important. And uh, the answer to the second question is, there's clearly margin for improvement. Okay, I just go on with a question for Benedict. Um, I think you, you, you mentioned there are around 62 cancer drugs on the EML, and, and you also mentioned that 10 of them, if I understood correctly, have got the greatest public health benefit. Where do you see from a global perspective uh, smart entry points where you would say this would be a good start for for a number of countries if they embark on on uh, cancer treatment. Yeah, so so the ten that were just uh, the the respondents had the opportunity to select ten doesn't mean that just right. ten okay. are. Um, right. But it's clear that if you look at the list of the top twenty that were selected overall, a lot of them are actually also older chemotherapeutic um, agents that are not available. And it clearly depends a little bit on the burden of disease in each country, which may be which may be different. But there, for example, a lot of childhood cancers which can be effectively treated with. Um, with some of the older medicines um, that are also not available. So this would be something. And um, I just want to mention, you know, uh, because um, there was a talk about the cost of a hamburger. A lot of these cancer medicines, you can eat hamburgers until the end of your life and you won't get close. So it's, 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 a, it's a little misleading. I think if we, we, we talk about um, um, different categories of prices are really enormous. And even if they were like uh, uh, half prices, it still would be largely unaffordable. But I think it's a little bit, um, we have essential medicines and each country needs to decide on, on their priorities. Any other question? There's one up there. Okay, is there a mic? Um, yes, thank you. My name is Elizabeth Masuta. I work for the Access Cam from, from Doctors Without Borders. And from our year-long experience, um, tiered pricing hasn't worked when there's no transparency. So in this new push for tiered uh, pricing, will there be more transparency? What country is paying for what? And I mean, we've heard uh, Professor Röller yesterday talking about also competition law in this regard. And I'm glad that you, um, Dr. Cooney mentioned the cost of production. Will there also be more transparency around the cost of production? Because as in the past, independent studies have shown when countries like J&J &J for Bedequilin, for example, have said they will sell at the cost of production, independent studies have shown that the price was actually lower, or the cost of production was actually lower than set by Johnson & Johnson. Thank you. Thomas. Much. Uh, if I may, I take the uh, the cost the cost or cost plus pricing first. I have to admit, as an economist, I believe in value based pricing. Uh, 
when you look at my iPhone, I have no clue what the cost of production is, except that I know it's a fraction of what I paid for it. Maybe 1%, maybe 2%, but probably not much. Uh, and in terms of medicines, we did have countries, industrialized countries historically, having cost plus pricing approaches. Uh, as an economist, I say it's, it's a heaven, it's a paradise for creative accountants. It doesn't lead to efficiency. I once looked into interferon prices. This was quite a few years ago, where in Japan, which was one of those countries, the company which was less effective in you know, producing, they got a higher price than the other company and they cornered the market. Doesn't make sense. When it comes to value-based pricing, and that's something which I think many people don't fully realize, somebody from the industry firmly committing to value-based pricing, value by definition will vary across different geographies in different countries because affordability varies, which means when you look at the value of, for example, insulin treatment in sub-Saharan Africa, the price has to be significantly lower than in Germany uh, because, uh, you know, the, the, the our uh, purchase power is so much different and that's something. When it comes to the transparency, I have to admit that I recently had a discussion with Gavi Gavi firmly believes that their chance of getting best price and they have a huge negotiating power really depends on them not publishing their prices because that gives them the leverage to squeeze the companies. I can tell you when I came into my Geneva post, I noticed, oh my God, my friends from the vaccine companies didn't like Gavi much because Gavi was so much nose noticed and UNICEF for market shaping. Market shaping means, means you squeeze, which by the way is one of the big challenges. And I see Sumya Swaminata in the end the room. Big challenges when we talk about if we want to be better prepared for future pandemics, and that may also go for some classic healthcare, we need to have better geographic diversity in manufacturing. And many of us are involved, be it with the German Roundtable or other initiatives in what can be done to create some local manufacturing capacity, for example, in Africa. Now, one conclusion of the excellent report, which was sponsored by the UK Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, was that no local manufacturer in Africa for many years to come would have any chance to compete with Indian generic companies based on UNICEF and Gavi market shaping, which means somehow if we are really serious about, for example, balancing the risk that Modi first or India first does hinder the export. There has been an export ban in place since early April, which does hinder access to vaccines in Africa. Then we need to find a way to overcome this handicap, which let's say among economists is not on it's not uncontroversial. <laughs> Any other question? Otherwise, I have a last one, and then we spare some time for the next part. There's one. Okay. It's not so much a question, <laughs> but uh, a statement from Alexander Belinsky. Dear Mr. Quaney, could you please address affordability issues of new medicines for low income populations, but above property level in high income countries? USA, for example. Now, I may be a bit heretic as an industry person, but I basically, and that's a personal belief, it's not an official association position, I believe in the good European social value healthcare mandate. Some countries prefer an NHS, like in the US, having lived in the US, I prefer the German or Swiss system where you do have a bit of choice and you can top it up. But actually, I do believe that actually, by and large, universal health care does mean that people, whether they're rich or poor, when you look at the social parameters of health, of, 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 of Marmot, should have access to basic healthcare, and it's a political decision in countries. 
I don't have voting rights in the US. <laughs> Good, probably a last question because this is about the MPP and Thomas, you, you've alluded to different um, approaches, tiered pricing, but also uh, increasingly voluntary licenses, uh, be that via bilateral deals or the MPP. What are the prerequisites from your experience overview dealing with different companies you would see uh, that pharma consider before deciding for or against voluntary licenses. You you mentioned Berg, so we've got a couple of companies that have already a track record also going back to HIV and others being more hesitant. Um, what do you think are the prerequisites those companies waiting for? Why would they not move um, towards voluntary licenses? I think different products have different characteristics and small molecules are different from biological products. Vaccines, for example, are different. I think what we saw now in the vaccine area, for example, the world benefited from Gavi and UNICEF having built up infrastructure over the last 20 years in India, because more than 20 years ago, you really didn't have a quality, uh, you know, high volume uh, delivering vaccine industry in India. And therefore, we, you really need to look at, do you have trusted partners? What do you need, for example, to engage in voluntary licensing? Now, in the MPP model, you have MPP as a conduit. But it puts a great deal of accountability on the MPP because as you know, colleagues uh, of mine from IFPMA knows, one of my favorite reading recommendations, and maybe Alex, you haven't read it, and others neither, is a book called Bottle of Lies, written by a Catherine Eben, a Carnegie fellow from the US, not a friend of the pharma industry. And when I read it, Two and a half years ago, first time, I was shocked about how people and patients in developing countries were getting substandard, poor quality, and many fake medicines. Therefore, when you do look at the voluntary licensing model or the MPP model, there is a responsibility for the license giver to make sure that the recipient of the license does have the quality. Now, I have to admit that's why I personally like the MPP approach, because this was built up by Charles Gore's predecessor, who now happens to work for he was me, here. and I think really succeeded to make the MPP respectable in the industry as a trusted partners, because basically companies delegate you know, the criteria the selection of the partner to the MPP. And I do believe there's room for expansion. When I came, this was almost five years ago, and I had my first meeting with Greg Perry, the then MPP CEO. I do recall my brief basically said, oh, MPP scope expansion, not a good idea. Negative, really. They get into areas where they don't know what they are talking about. And I've seen movement opening up of companies. That's why I really like the way MSD has now approached Molnupiravir. And, you know, they took the risk. Most people probably don't know that drug initially got a little bit of BADA funding for influenza. BADA turned it down for COVID-19. The company took the risk, invested at risk into COVID-19, didn't ask for government funding, and very early on, because they realized if you really want to make this accessible, you need to make it accessible for people in low-income countries. They did sit down. Gilead, by the way, on Remdesivir, I still believe that WHO has been too harsh uh, in just saying Remdesivir is useless. I think Remdesivir, clearly when I look at the usage also in Europe and the US, uh, has used for COVID-19, but Gilead did the same as they did with Hep C, a pretty aggressive, bold access strategy. I think initially they talked to the MPP. It would be probably a cocktail discussion why that failed. And I think it was more on the side of the MPP than on the side of Gilead. But companies are really keen because I see people understand 
And we see it in COVID-19 again, we have to do better on equity. We have to do better on access. And I think that's a conviction. It's one of the elements which honestly keeps me young in Geneva. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Thomas, and also Linda, for both presentations, Benedict, and, and your uh, contributions. So I hand over with that to Austin Thank you. from NORAD and for a deep dive into cardiovascular and diabetes. Thank you, Alex. So uh, nice to be with you here this morning. Um, and as Alex said, we're going to move over to hypertension, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. And uh, we have two introductory um, presentations, and then we're going to go to questions. Similarly, too. So, I'd like to welcome Professor Karen uh, Sliva, who's a cardiologist. She's with us in the room from South yes. Africa. So, we've got strong South African um, presence here today. So, Karen, please. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So, my talk is what hinders access to cardiovascular treatment, and that's obviously beyond medicine. So first, the problem. So many of you will know that 75% of all cardiovascular diseases are in low to middle income countries. And the majority of the conditions are similar to the high income countries, such as hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and stroke. But there are also very specific conditions um, like rheumatic heart disease, Chagas disease, which needs uh, specific aspects in diagnosis, but also in management. So what are the key barriers? So there are, I think, really the big problems is delayed access to prevention and diagnosis, which includes the tools to measure blood pressure. There are many clinics I know from many African countries who have one blood pressure machine. Sometimes that's broken. So you can't supply medicine if you can't even diagnose hypertension. Then electrocardiogram, many clinics in South Africa do not have an ECG. You cannot diagnose atrial fibrillation, very difficult without an ECG, perhaps by pulse, but it's not very accurate. Cardiac ultrasound, also very, it's too expensive, often not available, and that's really needed to diagnose structural heart disease for which you then can apply your medications. There's also a lack of investment in human resources, such as general healthcare workers, nurses, general practitioners, cardiologists working in effective teams, and that's important, the teamwork, and also according to tailored programs which are necessary for the respective countries. And then what we have heard already, access to an affordability to certain cardiovascular medication. But I really want to focus on the solutions, and I have three. So the one is prevention is key. So it was a recent publication by Philip Ross and us in the Lancet in August 2021, which highlighted the importance of the polypill. So the polypill is, can be various combination of drugs, but in that case, it was a combination of two blood pressure lowering medications and a statin with and without aspirin. And, and a fixed dose. And it showed um, a substantial in reduction in patients who have cardiovascular risk factors, but not disease. So surprisingly, you have a combination pills in, in different areas of medicine like HIV, tuberculosis, and others. But for whatever reason, it has not been really translated very broadly in the cardiovascular area. And the polypill could really produce a low cost and adherence would also improve. Solution two, I think task shifting and task sharing is really important. And with that, I mean that we are still focusing far too much on the medical doctor, the cardiologist to make a diagnosis, to talk about prevention. And um, I think blood pressure measurements, uh, automatic screening using ECG, the handheld devices using technologies to even have a two lead ECG and then there's handheld ultrasound, which is much cheaper and that could be really used to detect structural heart disease early, to detect atrial fibrillation <laughs> early. It still can be confirmed by a medical doctor, but I think we have to come away that everything has to be with a physician. It's, um, it, will, it really hinders pro progression. Then solution three. 
I think improved access to medication, many cardiovascular medication are affordable and, but quality insurance, you just heard it. I mean, fake medication is a huge problem. I know data from Nigeria is estimated that about a third of the medication you purchase for hypertension, heart failure medication is, is fake, is not having the content it should have, it's expensive to test content before you bring in drugs. It's a real issue and it needs to be addressed. Then just an example, the many other examples, like for instance, with non-vitamin K antagonists to treat atrial fibrillation, it's much easier than to use warfarin than to measure your INR. And it has been pushed by the World Heart Federation to be on the W essential drug list. But now we have to improve accessibility, affordability, and acceptability um, for this uh, medication, which really would make a big difference in stroke prevention, but it's doable. And then lastly, there is a bizarre issue of the use of penicillin. Penicillin is an, a key medication for the use of rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, and it's, it's often not available, also not in South Africa and many other countries. And it has a bizarre issue that is too cheap. It is, uh, there's not enough interest to produce a medication where you don't make pocket. And I think we really need another solution to um, perhaps a central production of certain medication to make it really available where it is much needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we'll come back to you in the question time. Now I'm gonna introduce you to Professor, and I hope I get the name right, Nabi Balda. Is that right, Nabi? Yes. How do you pronounce the second name? Yes, uh, from so, the Nabi Baldi. Baldi, International yeah. Diabetes Federation. You're coming to us from Guinea. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to share um, IDF uh, perspective on diabetes in uh, low and middle income country and barrier to oral treatment access. Let's start by providing some context. Um, in 2019, IDF estimated that uh, uh, 463 million adults lived with diabetes, three times more than 2000. This fast growing show how the epidemic is out of control. Over 1 million, uh, when uh, 1.1 1, 1 million children and adolescents live with uh, type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes account for around 90% of diabetes cases. In addition, we have a lot of people living with uh, impaired glucose tolerance and are at a high risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is not a problem of affluent society. It's also a big problem for low and middle income country. Half of the people living with diabetes are not diagnosed. This is especially an issue in low and middle income country since lack of diagnosis and treatment can lead to a number of complications and death. Diabetes related mortality has increased recently and uh, IDF estimate the number of diabetes case will continue to rise, putting a heavy burden on individual family and society, especially in low and middle income country. The situation in Africa is as follows. More than uh, 19 million adults with diabetes uh, live in Africa. This is the lowest prevalence among all the region, but uh, Africa will be the region with the highest increase of new cases of diabetes in the, in the next year. 60% of people living with diabetes are not diagnosed, and uh, three to four of them died uh, in, a premature, uh, in premature age. This situation is critical and all diabetes indicators are worsening. But despite the situation, government are not respond responding as required. 
The fund dedicated to diabetes care and type two diabetes prevention are insufficient. Diabetes awareness is still lacking in many countries where many misconceptions about the condition remain. The diabetes training of healthcare professional is often deficient. Access to diabetes care is still a challenge for millions. Half of the people who need insulin do not have access to a, real, a reliable and affordable supply. This includes 10 of 1,000 with type 1 who need insulin to survive. Access to over diabetes medicine and comorbidities, such as a neural medication, is also a significant issue. In my own country, for example, we can typically see that uh, private pharmacy offices are concentrated in the capital. Pharma wholesale distributors are absent for rural, from rural area. And the glyphosine has many new uh, drugs are just not available in the country. Mr. Chair, dear participant, we have seen two major political development this year, the launch of WHO Global Compact Diabetes and the adoption of WHO Resolution on Diabetes. These initiatives are key to change the current situation and drive action by improving type two prevention, especially among young people, ensuring timely diagnosis and access to effective and quality product WHO member state and the relevant stakeholder need to collaborate to improve access and the life of people living with diabetes world, worldwide. We need urgently to act now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof Professor Nabi. Thanks. And uh, it's important that you point so much to the, to the system and in-country uh, barriers to access, I think. Um, uh, prevention, uh, managing to get a diagnosis, effective management, and then and then finally the the uh, supply of drugs and the right prices. So um, I'm I'm asked to 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 give certain questions. I've been given some questions, but I'm actually going to go a little bit off script, Benedict, um, and ask you the first question. So Thomas has has mentioned that he thinks that the criteria for for inclusion on the ML should be largely medical, and you you gave us a very clear medical statement about four to six months life improvement. You weren't so clear about the economic aspects. So, so uh, these five cancer drugs were not included because of high price, and yet you acknowledge that many of the drugs on the EML aren't broadly accessible and, and partly for price reasons. And then your last point on your slide talked about by putting things on the EML, you hope to improve access and contribute to UHC. So how, 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 how do you figure in the economic side when you're considering the inclusion in the EML? And then how do you take the list to the poorer countries with much lower public investment in healthcare services and, and give advisory around what they should and shouldn't be including? Because it wasn't entirely clear. Yeah, the, the thing is, it is not entirely clear because um, officially, as I showed in the 2001 um, um, uh, guidance document on how um, medicines should be at its price is not an issue, but this was 2001. And in 20 years, um, prices have skyrocketed for, for, many, for many medicines. And um, this would be one of the tasks of uh, potentially the working group to see um, how, how um, to deal with this issue of price and the EML. It's clear that um, um, the many people from low middle income countries said, if you add some of these very high cost medicines to the list, this will um, um, then potentially deviate also uh, resources from other areas um, that are maybe um, where you can get more for the for the same amount of money invested and um, the hope is that still and i admit that um, we have to get better data on that that by adding medicines on the eml potentially especially if, since we try to favor also inclusion of biosimilars and uh, if possible and and as many potential therapeutic alternatives as possible to give countries the opportunity um, to have several options to choose from and thus um, potentially lower prices. Again, you have the issue that prices are not transparent. Um, so it's very difficult to really also assess uh, the impact on, on, on prices. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, if I can be a little yeah. bit provocative, what I read out of what Benedict just said is, uh, who cares about criteria, we make them up, uh, you know, while we act on the ML. And I believe that's not a very scientific approach. And one of the elements which I, I, I've had a few discussions with Marie-Angela Schimar because I was in the Fair Pricing Forum in Amsterdam. I was at the one in Johannesburg. It was recently a virtual one. And something which I personally really deeply regret, there's not, you know, this open dialogue in terms of what could we do together? For example, I must say I was deeply disappointed recently, my colleague, uh, my colleague who was uh, in the diabetes, all my colleagues who were involved in discussion of the diabetes compact, companies were really keen to get, you know, with the foundations, together with the companies, together with people living with diabetes to make progress and to look at the multiple multifactorial elements of hindering people to have access to proper diabetes care, which can be I know one company which did a philanthropic example, and they gave insulin for free at the point of care. And then the guy who suffered and seriously came back two months later in a much worse shape. And they asked him, why didn't you come? And he said, I couldn't afford to take it for the bus. Mm-hmm. And, and we have heard from, from Linda about some of the poor state, you know, state, states of healthcare when people have to walk you know for hours to get to a barefoot doctor we really need to look at what does happen and i think one of the elements mentioned also by khan is when you look at prevention on cardiovascular disease it goes far beyond the treatment if you need treatment something is already wrong i'm a strong believer in you know uh, be healthy be mobile which means uh, I normally exceed my 10,000 steps at least three to four times per day. But one of the elements which is most disappointing is when then WHO called out for join now the Global Diabetes Compact element, somehow they forgot to invite the private sector. I couldn't believe it. And when Vanessa inquired what happened, it was said, oh, this was not us. It was a mistake by some outside consultant. Now, come on, be serious. How can you get make progress? All right, but I, I'd like to get, yeah, sector. because I think you have tried to be provocative and say that it's just <laughs> random. Secondly, I, to be provocative back to you, I mean, we yes, there are many barriers in accessing healthcare and transport costs, but those are not within the means. And, and here, what we're talking about is access to medicine and the pricing and structure around, around pharmaceutical sales. So there are other problems uh, around prevention and, and access to, to the system, but there are problems that we're trying to face here today, which is squarely within the, the realm of, of uh, pharma production and, and, and trade and, and procurement. So let's not get into the other issues so much, but could Ben, could you respond a little bit about where you think you're going with the use of the EML as a tool for UHC? and priority setting and how you're going to be more uh, open yeah. about the uh, economic dimensions yeah. around us. Please. Yeah, um, I, first of all, I just want to say it's the criteria are not made up, right? It's an expert committee deciding um, um, for a lot of these medicines. It was not just the price, as I mentioned, was also the uh, issue of uh, lack of diagnostics, infrastructure, et cetera, just to, just to complement that. Um, just another comment, because the phone was mentioned, you know, phones get uh, don't get continuously more expensive. They get more potent, but they don't, haven't increased uh, in price. Uh, they, they, they even went down. So um, I think one thing we definitely need to do is now to be proactive to see also what happens, for example, um, since insulin analogs are now included, what happens to accessibility and price? Um, because um, um, we have the assumption that adding a medicine on the essential medicines list will um, improve accessibility. But if you look at the data, they're pretty scarce, limited to uh, very few examples. So that's something we definitely um, um, plan to do. And, um, you know, I can't provide you the solution for the um, price economic framework because it's incredibly complicated and that was just the point that was recognized by the experts. Um, we had two weeks of discussions and this point came over again and again and it was a little bit like going in circles and 
I, I think that was also the idea to have um, a more structured approach with experts from many different areas um, to find a, 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 a um, a framework, a solution to to how better to handle this. Um, but I can't, um, you know, if there wasn't <laughs> if there wasn't need for a working group, if I could just uh, state my solution like this now. Okay, yeah. Karen, um, to you. Uh, thank you very much for some very clear proposals. And I think one of the things you you mentioned was was a, a comb combination pill. So I think you're pointing here that it's not just about price. It's not the it's not Delivering technologies that are that are scaled for delivery in high high income countries and Western delivery systems, we also have to think about the context in which we're delivering in them and 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 create uh, innovation that is that is suited to the local. How do you think we can um, scale the EML uh, list to be used more broadly and particularly at primary healthcare levels? So you've talked about task shifting, but you've also talked about different kinds of combinations of drugs cheaper technologies, handheld technologies. Um, uh, a lead example, novel, novel uh, oral anticoagulants. Why aren't, they, why aren't they available at the primary healthcare level extensively in South Africa? Mm, I mean, first I think um, the polypill concept, I'm also really puzzled why we are so behind in the cardiovascular field um, because in, so, in other areas it has moved forward so quickly. And I think some is also politics. I think different companies like to market their own product um, and you need a certain agreement to, to combine certain medication. And I think that I think it's one of the key elements. And I really think if you can take one tablet a day, then instead, I mean, I'm a heart failure specialist. I mean, many of my, my patients are on seven, eight medications. Obviously, you can't combine all those medications, but you can simplify medications. And I think that would improve adherence. We haven't even mentioned the word adherence in this forum now, but adherence is, is key. I mean, you will know that even in the Western world, it's only 70% of the patients actually take the medication if you look six months later or a year later. So it's all fine if it's affordable, if it's cheaper, but pe if people are not convinced, if they don't take the medication, we are not achieving our goal to improve, have better health care. Mm. So that's a one issue. I really think a polypill has to be negotiated. There can be several combinations. And I think that would really bring cardiovascular treatment a big step forward. And then I think we need to, I don't agree with the concept that you can totally separate um, cost of medication and achieving the goal of better health. And I, I really think it has to be in combination with education in all countries. If you don't understand what health problem you have, you will not take the medication. So it has, and I think the responsibility is by the, can start at school, but it can be Department of Health and the private sector. And if we don't come to the point where we combine health education, um, pricing, and then access to medication with all what we have mentioned, we will not win. And I really think that just having an essential list with a certain price will not achieve the goal. So, and then finally to, to digital health, I mean, in many low income countries, you have a very advanced uh, digital access is cheap. The phones are cheaper, data are cheap, and it's totally, un we can really use the situation to improve um, how you get your medication instead of the old fashioned system that you have to travel to get your medication. There will be other models, how it can be delivered and bulk to churches or to other public spaces and packages which the patient can collect it will be much cheaper than each person going to the pharmacy which is in a town 100 kilometer away fetching their medication once a month so i think using digital tools will really uh, improve access to healthcare. professor nabi um could you tell you you mentioned a lot of of uh, issues um affecting access of care for diabetes. You didn't talk so specifically about access to medicines. Could you tell us um, what, what's on the shelves in Guinea? Do you see all of the products in the EML for diabetes on the shelves in Guinea? And is there a big difference between Conakry, the, the capital, and, and rural areas? 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, we do not have access to needed medicine. And uh, I think the price is the first problem, definitely, because we have access to, uh, uh, if you consider uh, the drug we have inside the country, it's uh, usually the less priced drugs. So we need to address the, the price, definitely. It's not only, it's not the, 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 the only problem, but it's a main problem. Um, behind prices, we need to, uh, to, to work on uh, availability, but availability is linked to, to the price. Um, and uh, we need also, has already mentioned, to work on uh, health system in global, uh, access to diagnosis, affordability of uh, uh, supply chain. Uh, it's a comprehensive approach. We are all, uh, uh, we all agree on that. But I think price of medication is a key element uh, to, to start with, yeah. Okay, and so so I understand that the SGR two inhibitors have been put onto the EML for second line treatment of diabetes type two. Um, what would what do you think it will take to get access to those in Guinea? Uh, the problem we are facing is uh, that in in Guinea context, like uh, many uh, sub-Saharan African country, uh, we do not have social security. So people pay for their own medi medication for, for everything. Out uh, of pocket expenses is very high. So uh, sometimes government are doing an effort to give free medicine, but we are in the context for government perspective of competition between communicable disease, epidemics, and non-communicable disease. So we do not have enough uh, investment, investment on uh, non-communicable disease. So I think if the price is uh, more affordable for even government, government will be in a better position to buy those medicine and uh, make them available for uh, for, for, for many uh, people inside the country. Um, we need definitely on that area too, to work on uh, health coverage in general. But uh, in country like mine, um, many people are very, very poor and uh, rely only on government to have access to diagnosis, to treatment and to, to drugs. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Nabi. So I'm gonna give the last question to you, Thomas. Um, so you get the last word. <laughs> so, so we've heard a bit here. I mean, you've talked about the willingness of companies to do tier pricing, um, and you've worked about the importance of sitting down together to work through barriers to get improved access. Um, how much appetite, um, so, so the demographic growth, where, where people are going to be living is increasingly moving uh, towards Asia and then eventually to Africa. So those are where the big human market's gonna be. The big the humanity is gonna rest in Asia and, and Africa as opposed to Europe and, and North America. How much appetite do you think there is for companies to start actually innovating for, for the context that we're talking about? Building poly pills, um, extending shelf life, providing simpler products, not just tier pricing because uh, all the surveys I've seen at country level, despite the willingness to do tier pricing, all the surveys you see about prices that patients face, they're not tiered down from what European patients face. They're 30 to 40 times higher. And it just seems absurd that people in Africa are facing prices many, many, many times higher than, than patients in richer countries. So that's, that seems a really, really strange situation. And, how, and whilst a lot of the costs are in country, they're not more than 50%. So it means that the procurers are buying at much, much higher price. What can we do to, uh, what, what does, do, do your uh, members need to try and bring products to countries at 
at, in bulk and at much lower price and still make a profit because it has to be sustainable? I think we probably would need another 90 minutes to even start addressing the complexity of the problem, but you, you can't approach that problem without looking how do we make progress on UHC? Mm -hmm. And we have really not made sufficient progress on universal health coverage in most low and middle income countries. And that needs government action. I've heard Dr. Tedros in the past say again and again, it really, we need more willingness of governments to pay. We also, also need to realize that nobody can solve the problem on its own. You do need governments, you do need a civil society, you need the healthcare workers and the industry. When it comes to what you said about the multi pill, and I heard Callan talk about that, honestly, I believe it's better not to overpromise and under deliver. I grew up in an area where basically combination products were seen extremely critically for a number of reasons, because they were seen as pharmacologically complex, problematic. I've, on the other hand, when we look at how HIV treatments evolved, it really moved from very complex, I think up to 20 uh, pills per day to you know the combination, but that was in one disease area. I, I believe that to a large extent, when you look at cardi cardiovascular drugs, to a large extent, we are talking about quality generic products. That's the same in our countries. Uh, Norway, for example, didn't use a torvastatin until it was generic. Norway is not one of the poor countries in the world. And, uh, and uh, when you look at the essential medicines list, most of the drugs in the essential medicines list are generic. Therefore, it's totally different when we talk about UHC, when we talk about basic care. I think most of it will continue to be generic in cardiovascular. Now, some of the big pharma companies do have significant generic businesses, such as Novartis. But I do believe that we need to overcome this paradigm and we need to move towards much more much bolder uh, tiered pricing but tiered pricing in the context of really addressing the need as a package in, in for example in diabetes i see a willingness of companies to do that and i see a keen interest of companies to overcome the hurdles they are price is just one of many, but you can't say price is none. Great, thank you very much indeed, uh, particularly to our, our two chairs, um, Alex Schultz from, from STC in Switzerland and uh, uh, Austin Davis from NORAD in Norway, both of whom have been very strong supporters either directly or through Unitaid of the Medicines Patent Pool. Um, and it's lovely to have other people do all the work in forms of former <laughs> chairing. So thank you both very much. And thank you indeed to all our speakers in the room and, um, and online and uh, to everyone uh, in the audience and for your questions. Um, I'd just like to uh, say in closing that um, it's very encouraging to, to hear um, what you said, Thomas, about the increasing willingness of, of industry to partner with the medicines patent pool. And I, I'd just like to say that um, the Lancet Public Health is, uh, this morning has published an article about the impact of the medicines patent pool's work, um, which is, is worth reading. And I think it shows what voluntary licensing can deliver and, and in particular public health transparent voluntary licensing. So with that, uh, having thanked you all, I'd just like to uh, introduce Philippe Duneton, the executive director of Unitaid, uh, who set up the medicines patent pool uh, 11 years ago and um, have been continued to be really uh, strong and important supporters and partners with the medicines patent pool to make a few closing remarks. Philippe. Thank you, Charles, and um, thanks for the invitation, and um, thanks for the panel, for all the discussion. So I will not uh, try to summarize the rich discussion, of course, um, but a couple of, uh, of remarks. Um, yes, I've been working at the beginning on the medicine patent pool, 
And um, the first time it was MSF, so, so I'm represented in the, in, the, in the room today, explained it to me and said, brilliant ideas. I don't know how this can work. And I think we make it work with the medicine patent pool, with the industry, with civil society. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the publication on the Lancet, because since the beginning, it was doing the work, but also how we can measure the impact. And I know uh, all the effort that you and your team have, have made over time with different models. And I think that it's the first publication in a, a newspaper, a peer review. And I think it's, as you mentioned, the way you do it, voluntary license with transparency are shown absolutely a great impact. And nobody can contest it now. I think it's in terms of credibility of the organization, in terms of uh, power, it's absolutely important. So you did the right thing. And uh, I'm very pleased for, the, for this work. The second is a little bit about um, UNITED because, and it was discussed during the panel, the what makes UNITED UNITED is how to think about access. Access means the right drug, the right price, the right quality. But more importantly, what we try to do is to articulate, to link access issues to model of care. And I think it's quite powerful. We have learned not only with HIV, but with HIV. We started 20 years ago when I was a real doctor a long time ago. We're very technical, uh, very scientific, very hospitalized, central, uh, central, centralized way to care about HIV. See, now you have simple treatment, affordable treatment, better tolerated, one pill instead of 20 pills that Thomas remember but also uh, community-based intervention. You can do self-test academic-based intervention. And I think that's, that's the, when I talk about model of care, I mean, you describe also in the cardiovascular how we can think, how we can decentralize. So I think it is pairing the two that is powerful. And of course, I think there is one word that I've, coming back to, um, COVID-19, but also um, um, non-communicable disease. But one word is important for us, is how we can create markets. Thomas said, well, we have to create generic market, good quality generic market. And I'm absolutely with you, in particular for the small molecules, and in particular for the fight against COVID-19. We know the challenge in, in terms of clinical data, let the FDA, WHO, others do their work. But if it works, a small molecule, it's not so complicated. The real complication is also the model of care. So how we link diagnostic with access to care, because shooting in the dark is not a good idea in medicine. It's not, I mean, molnupiravir is not a candy. So we need to detect the people at risk. We need the, people, the diabetic with diabetes, for example. So this is something that we need, we need to take, take seriously. But it's all, also a way to create markets because you need to think about where, who, who will pay, what is available. And I'm just, I can announce today that as, as a co-head of the therapeutic pillar, we have money to put on the table with um, unit and fine for the part of diagnosing how it works at the country in 20 countries in Africa, already up and running. We have money to buy um, medication from UNICEF and also a commitment from the Global Fund because we need to create market, generic market. The last point in terms of uh, UHC, I think that uh, as UNITED, we recognize um, the potential of that kind of approach. It's not so far part of our mandate. Uh, we have experience you know, with co-infection, uh, trying to tackle the cervical cancer because you can be treated for HIV. Unfortunately, a lot of women will die from cervical cancer. So it's also something that we have taken on board with the way um, to, to train nurses for three months to give them the right tools to give them support because you cannot expect 
one health worker alone, even with the good medicine to do good job. So it has to be, you know, part of, of the system. My hope in the future that United will be more and more engaged with the partners in terms of what means really primary health care, because we have bits and pieces <laughs> overall, but I think that it has to come together. It will be more powerful. But again, and the last thing I, I want to say is, I'm not sure that you're pricing the future of access in the low and middle income countries. And I think that gave a lot of reason uh, for that. Um, one of the reasons, if you look at, um, you know, I think what is more important for me is public health, is burden of disease. I think it's more powerful the, than the classification of the World Bank, to be honest. And if you look at the, the situation of COVID-19, most of the scope of the license today are based on HIV. And this is a starting point, I, uh, I suspect, because the burden of disease for HIV is very concentrated in certain countries. And I think industry made the move to make it right. But you cannot apply the same criteria to COVID-19. If you are doing that, you leave half of the people in need outside the scope. And I don't think it's right. So I will stop there. A lot of good discussion. I think that we made a lot of progress. I discussed with industry. I see, anyway, progress, I think, in the coming weeks. And I think that uh, we still need to build the momentum and to address, um, to fix this pandemic and move on. Thank you. Over.